I have to tell them, everybody. I hope everybody's enjoying their Shabbat day. I hope everybody has been keeping everybody and prospering everybody in the works of the law and the fruits of the Spirit. We thank you and we greet you to Hebrew Readers Church. We hope that I have been prospering you this day and that he just continues to, to work in you and to work in us all, preparing us for what's to come and keeping us for the day that we are in. May Ahia be blessed and may Yahweh be praised, our one and true Savior and the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Akwadoshi, our mother. Uh, I'm your brother, Zakwa. I'm Kasafu. And we welcome you to Hebrew Readers Church. Uh, today we will be going into the tribe of Judah. There's a lot of misconceptions with the tribe of Judah, and it's going to be great to go into it and actually see by the end of the lesson who are actually from the tribe of Judah because there's certain characteristics of the tribe of Judah and there's been so many misconceptions that all the slaves in America and such so forth are from the tribe of Judah but as we know that we were all spread into the four corners of the earth so a lot of people who think that Judah may fall into Benjamin or Levi so it's going to be very interesting to see Brother Kasafo? Yes. So, today, the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah, which are Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, predominantly with a remnant of the ten tribes, have been sold into slavery across the world and are among all nations via the slave trade. The inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah were scattered throughout the lands of Shem, Ham, and Japheth by the days of the apostles by evidence of Acts chapter 2. Uh, Zach, what can you read? Acts chapter 2, verse 5, and then verse 9 to 11, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. The, all the nations where the sons of Noah dwelt, which is North Africa, Europe, and Asia, and the islands of the Mediterranean Sea. They were people of the kingdom of Judah in all these nations under heaven. They were not in the regions of Osirath where the ten tribes had went. Uh, continue, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 9. Parthians and Mede and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, and Pargia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of Allah. Now, the ten tribes at that time predominantly were gone abroad to the regions of Arsara. Then the nations came and took them all captive, along with the inhabitants of Judah that were back in the lands of the sons of Noah. Uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 2, and verse 3, please. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the Judah. nations. My bad. I got into it. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell to you, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we see my people, there was Judah and Israel. So the nations continue, please whom they have scattered among the nation and parted my land. As we see through the slave trade, prophecy has come to pass. Continue, please. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Notice they cast lots for my people. Therefore, here the children of Israel are. We're all over the world. And we're under different lots. Some of us are now French. Some of us are now American. Some of us are now British and Dutch and so on and so forth. It, the tribes of the kingdom of Judah were enslaved in the lands of Shem and Ham and Japheth and taken into captivity to the regions of Osirath around the world. That's how we can differentiate to know who has the higher probability of being from the kingdom of Judah as opposed to the ten tribes because of the regions where they were enslaved from. Can you read Joel? Chapter 3, verse 4 and 6, please. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? And all the this is interesting. of Palestine. 
I apologize. Let me get my timing right. I'm sorry. Ty and Zidon, these are quote unquote people of color. These are the children of Ham. So even when you hear of blacks selling blacks, the scriptures tell of the same thing. All right, continue, please. Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me, swiftly and speedily will I turn your recompense unto your own head. Uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 6. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Notice what the plan was. This is important to know how you can differentiate the southern kingdom from the northern kingdom. Knowing that the whole effort was to remove the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem far from their borders, which the slave trade did help forward the effort, the areas of the ten horns have been chief in the merchandising of slaves to scatter the inhabitants of Judah. Even the scriptures show who Tyre and Zidon was doing business with. Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 13, please. David. That's Greece. Tubal. That's Italy. And Meshach. That's Portugal and Spain. These are nations of the ten horns. Continue, please. They were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. There we see they were chief in slave trading and trading people. So we can understand through scripture why it was the ten horns selling us. And we know through that trade, it was according to prophecy that we'll end up in the regions by ships as Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68 shows, please. And I shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. Therefore, understanding history through scripture, if one's ancestry stems back to the slaves, the Negroes, the Bantus of Africa, or the cargo slave ships, then one is highly likely to be from the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi, with a slim chance of Simeon or the Ten Tribes. On the other hand, if one's ancestry stems back to any Native American or indigenous people of the Americas and Caribbean, or the Aboriginals and indigenous tribes of the Indian Ocean or Pacific Ocean, then is highly likely you are from the Ten Tribes of Israel. In one's personal search for one's tribal origin, one must start by prayer because we have to make our requests known with supplication. And one has to look at our father's lineage to know our tribes according to the scripture, like Numbers chapter 1, verse 2 and 22. This series of lessons are to identify the 12 tribes individually according to the spiritual indicators that the patriarchs documented their children would face. We know the signs and the curses that help identify the children of Israel around the world today. Yet through the spiritual indicators in the admonitions of the patriarchs, one can identify which specific tribe a person of the house of Israel originates from. It is by the Spirit, Ahia has given the grace to truly identify which tribe people actually come from, since it is she that brings things to remembrance, searcheth all things, and we cannot know anything except the Spirit reveal them. And you can reference John 16, verse 13. 14 and 26, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Now, getting into identifying the tribe of Judah. Jacob spake of what will befall Judah in the last days. When we look at Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 to 12, please. Genesis 49 and 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. From the jump, he's talking to Yahweh. Because Yahche, according to the flesh, is in the loins of Judah. And the spirit of Yahche is in Judah, because <laughs> Judah was righteous. All right, continue, please. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. He will subdue his enemies, as a man holding a person down by their neck. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. And this is so. Every knee shall bow and confess that Yahche is Lord. Continue, please. Judah is a lion's whelp. This is interesting. <laughs> He's a lion's baby, right? Okay. Continue, please. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. 
Now, this was interesting because it's speaking of Yache, showing that even today as the adult lion subdues the prey, and then you see the little baby cubs come out and eat, Showing that Yache's father subdued all things under his feet, and then Yache's coming up to eat as the lion's well. Continue, please. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? And now Yache is crouched down, waiting. He's patiently waiting, sitting on the right hand of the father, waiting to see who shall rouse him up for him to come. All right, continue, please. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. This was a covenant that was given unto him. Right? Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. There shall always be a man of the posterity of Judah to be a lawgiver. They said from between his feet, that's from his loins, that the kingship will not depart from him. No matter what will happen to the children of Judah, the kingship will not depart. And there will always be a lawgiver of his children. And of course, this is also speaking of Yahshua because he shall be king and priest, Melchizedek. All right, continue, please. Until Shiloh come. So there will always be a child of Judah to help be a lawgiver until the kingdom come. All right, continue, please. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The gathering of the people shall be unto Yahshua. Yahshua's spirit is going to be in a man of the house of Judah to gather his people unto him. All right, continue, please. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's coat unto the choice vine. Now, this is interesting. Notice he had two colts. There was the foal, that's the one donkey, and then his ass's coat, that's the female donkey's child. So there's two donkeys that's being binded to the vine. That's Judah and Israel. Two tribes being gathered back and brought unto the vine. As Yache said, I am the vine and you are the branches. <laughs> he was, it was showing he's going to bring the house of Israel and the house of Judah back onto him. He's going to bind them back onto him. And after he does that, what's he going to do next? He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Then he's going to take vengeance. That's Isaiah 63 when he's going to come down on Bozra and going to come in his wrath because that's when everything has come to its fullness verse 12 please his eyes shall be red with wine his teeth white with milk because he's full at this point his children are gathered and he's full with his indignation for what the nations are doing and he's coming in the end all right now moses also spake of the blessings of judah in deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 7 please Deuteronomy 33 and 7. And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies. Now, <laughs> again, Moses is speaking to Yahshua in Judah. He said, Hear, Ahaya, the voice of Judah. Yahshua is our mediator. He's an advocate that makes supplication for us. So he's saying, bless him, hear his prayers for us, because that's the way we're going to be saved. And bring him unto his people, because Ahaya is who strengthens him. Ahaya is who prospered him in the earth, and Ahaya is who is going to prosper him to return. Bring him unto his people, so let him come. As we say, uh, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? And let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies, knowing that is still the father, the big lion that subdues the prey for the little lion, which is Yache. So you see the prophecies are calling for Ahaya to deliver Yache to do what he was prophesied to do. That's the blessing. Interesting, as you all have seen through seeing these blessings and these prophecies that pertain to Yache from Reuben all the way up here to Judah. That's why he's our rejoicing and we have no confidence in the flesh, knowing that it's all about our Lord. All right, Testament of Judah. Let's get into it here. Starting at chapter 1, please. Uh, Testament of Judah, chapter 1, verse 1. The copy of the words of Judah, what things he spake to his son before he died. They gathered themselves together, therefore, and came to him, and he said to them, Hearken, my children, to Judah, your father. I was the fourth son born to my father Jacob, and Leah, my mother, named me Judah, saying, I give thanks to Ahiah. Because he hath given me a fourth son also. 
I was swift in my youth and obedient to my father in everything. And I honored my mother and my mother's sister. And it came to pass when I became a man that my father blessed me, saying, Thou shalt be a king, prospering in all things. And we see his blessings came through his obedience in all things, honoring his parents and his mother's sister. The children of Judah today, they struggle with obedience to their father, honoring their mother, and honoring adults that aren't their parents. We can see this struggle in Ur and Onan, the sons of Judah, who would not obey him to take Tamar to wife by the bad counsel of their mother, and also Rehoboam for not honoring the counsel of the elders of Israel. So we can see the difference of what a true Judah is supposed to operate like as opposed to what his children are doing today. Continue, please. And a higher showed me favor in all my works, both in the field and in the house. Judah's children are also very industrious. Hence, you have Bezalel, who built the tabernacle. Solomon, he built the temple and he built those houses and built up the cities. And you have many kings of Judah who are known for building. Hence, today, a lot of Judites, not all, but many can be found in a construction field or into building and designing. <laughs> Don't forget about it's Thomas. That's Thomas, yes. Oh, wow. Thomas went to India and built a palace for the king in heaven. <laughs> that, thank you. Praise I, yes. And he, we, we know Thomas is a Judite. He was Yachin's brother. <laughs> so you see how it's something that they're known for. Even Judah himself, he built the city of Timna. So Judah's they're industrious. They like to work their hands. They like to design things that's just, just in them. Now, continuing here. Judah's children are also known for telling about the deeds and feats of strength of their youth. It's not a sin to tell about something that happened in the past, but for this tribe, they struggle with glorying in the deeds and strength of their youth, as their father is going to tell about. Let's continue reading, please. I know that I raced a hind and caught it and prepared the meat for my father, and he did eat. You can cook, Zach? Yeah. So Judas can cook too. <laughs> <laughs> this also shows Judah wasn't selfish, looking out for himself. I right, continue, please. And the roles I used to master in the chase and overtake all that was in the plains. A wild mare I overtook and caught it and tamed it. It's interesting. He was another identifier. He actually trained the animal. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Go on. Tell him, please. Yeah, Judas have an interesting thing with animals. We have a gift to understand animals. Like a lot of Judas deal with animals like dogs or whatever the case is. And they get into like more like dog training or they might train their own dog or whatever the case is or their own animals. It's innate in us to be able to tame animals. Interesting. There we see a lot of people that like to have pit bulls and whatnot. Wouldn't be surprised if they're Judah, if they fit along with the other things that go in the scripture. Yeah, because even Judah had a dog. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I slew a lion and plucked a kid out of his mouth. I took a bear by his paw and hurled it down the cliff, and it was crushed. I outran a wild boar, and seizing it as I ran, I tore it in thunder. A leopard in Hebron leaped upon my dog, and I caught it by the tail and hurled it on the rocks, and it was broken in twain. I found a wild ox feeding in the fields, and seizing it by the horns and whirling it around and stunning it, I cast it from me and slew it. And when the two kings of the Canaanites came, seated in armor against our flocks and much people with them, my father Jacob slew the king of Hazor and smote him on the greaves, and dragged him down. And the other king of Tapia, as he sat upon his horse, I slew, and so scattered all his people. With Akor the king, okay. a man of giant stature, I found hurling javelins before and behind as he sat on horseback. And I took up a stone of sixty pounds weight, and hurled it, and smote his horse, and killed it. And I fought with this other for two hours. And I clave his shield in twain. And I chopped off his feet and killed him. And as I was stripping off his breastplate, behold, nine men, his companions, began to fight with me. 
and I wound my garment on my hand, and I slung stones at him, and killed four of them, and the rest fled. Jacob my father slew Belishab, king of all the kings, a giant of strength, twelve cupids high, and fear fell upon them. They ceased warring against us. Therefore my father was free from anxiety in the wars when I was with my brethren. But he saw a vision concerning me, that an angel of might followed me everywhere, that I should not be overcome. And the children of Judah, when it comes to matters of war, they are skilled in fighting, being prosperous. And, well, today we probably look at it as sports or athletic ability. And Judah prevailed in his obedience and his feats of strength in war because an angel was with him. Even so, it is still amongst his children, by example of David, who slew the bear and the lion and killed Goliath with a mere slingshot. David set an example of a righteous Judite because he understood that it was the angel that helped him and didn't glory in his deeds as if it was by the strength of his own arm. Because Judites struggle with glorying in their feats and deeds. If you can read Gad the Seer, chapter 6, verse 1 to 9. Gad the Seer, chapter 6, verse 1. And Ahiah said to Gad, Go to David my servant and tell him, Thus saith Ahiah, let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let him that glorieth glory in this, that my help is with him. Then thou shalt go, and fear not, for Ahiah is with you. Gad came, and told David the words of Ahiah. And David said to Gad, I have known the help of Ahiah from my youth. But who smote the lion and the bear? Who smote the Philistine? Who smote my enemies? Was it not the help of Elohim? And when Ahiah heard that, it was well pleasing in his sight. And he said, Because David has known my help in his glory, for that my help would dwell in the house of David forever. And Gad said the words of Ahiah to David. David prostrated himself before Ahiah and said, Blessed be Ahiah, for I have found favor in his eyes. There we see a good example of how a Judite ought to look at things, to see things in truth. And may that be an exhortation for the children of Judah to glory in Ahiah for all that he's given. Judah understanding through his experience what is well pleasing in the sight of Ahiah beforehand commanded his children not to glory in the deeds of youth. And we can understand why. Because it's the angel of Ahiah that enables them, not their own strength. You can read Testament of Judah, chapter 12, verse 1, please. And now I command you, my children. Hearken to Judah your father and keep my sayings to perform all the ordinances of Ahiah and to obey the commandments of Elohim. This cure is important for you all. Keep Judah's sayings in his testament and perform all Ahiah's ordinances with obedience to his commands, not your own. Continue, please. Walk not after your lust, nor in the imaginations of your thoughts and haughtiness of heart. Judites struggle with walking after their lusts and whatever thoughts they have in their mind and being arrogant about it. In layman's terms, they do whatever they want according to their desire and their imaginations. And being arrogant, no one can tell them anything to stop them as was the case with Uzziah, the king, who wouldn't listen to the priest when he wanted to offer incense against the ordinance. So they'll stick to whatever they have in their mind, no matter what you say. Sadly, they have to get struck down by Allah Hayyam to take heed, as was the case for Uzziah. So when interacting with Judites, you just have to bring up questions to make them consider if what they're doing or thinking is right, and let them come to the conclusion, as did Nathan, who acted wisely with King David. If they don't come to the conclusion to change their mind from what they're doing, all you can do is just pray for them. Because Allah Hayyam has to bring them down through some experience that they'll have from the arrogant mind. As was the case for Judah, as we'll read about. Because if you just try to stop them, their arrogance leads them to do it anyway. As haughtiness would cause a person to act disdainfully, not valuing your opinion, as was the case with Uzziah. So you essentially have to let the Judite just go through the experience to learn for himself. If Allah Hayyam wills to open his heart. Let's continue, please. Hold on real quick. Before we continue, I want to touch on the inner thoughts and the inner workings of Judah. Um, now, the scripture said, Walk not after your lust, nor the imaginations of your thoughts, and the haughtiness of heart. So, as far as Judites, we have to stay joyful 
because the devil attacks us in sorrow or, or unhappiness. Usually when a Jew that makes it to the point where he or she is concrete in their thoughts of lust, it's because of unhappiness or something emotional that transpired either recently or in the past that they can't let go of. So this is the important thing about Judites. We have to be like a fish. We have to go through whatever it is, and we have to let it go and continue moving forward and not stay in it. Because if we stay in it, then it's going to be a stronghold upon us. It's literally going to be holding us down or holding us back from being able to be perfect in Meshiach And a lot of people, they, a lot of Judites, they fall into this and they get stuck. They're like stuck in the mud and they can't get out of it. But we have to be able to do that, and that's the only way that we can stay out of our lust or overcome our lust. So we we really have to be mindful of not holding things. And this goes for all of the tribes. It's a great thing for everybody to be able to, to go through it and to let it go and leave it in the past. And don't bring it back up. Let Let it go. Get over it. And continue moving forward, pushing on to the goal in Meshiach Yache. Thank you, brother. Can you pick back up at the Testament of Judah, chapter 12, the rest of verse 3, please? And glory not in the deeds and strength of your youth, for this also is evil in the eyes of Ahiah. This cure is simple for the children of Judah, not to glory in these things, knowing that it's evil in the sight of Ahia. David was blessed to be strengthened in heart to know it was Ahia's help with him from the testimonies of his tribe, so that he may glory in Ahia's help. Judah, on the other hand, had to learn to glory in Ahia and not in his strength and deeds of his youth through his experiences that brought him unto repentance. All right, we're in chapter 4. And in the south there came upon us a greater war than that of Shechem. And I joined in battle array with my brethren, and pursued a thousand men, and slew of them two hundred men. Jacob my father slew four kings. And Naphtali went up upon the wall and slew four mighty men. And so we captured Hazor and took all the spoil. On the next day we departed to Zeratin, a city strong and walled and inaccessible, threatening us with death. But I approached on the east side of the city, and Gad and Asher on the west. And they that were upon the wall, thinking that we were alone, were drawn down against us. And so my brother secretly climbed up the wall on both sides by stakes, and entered the city while the men knew it not. And we took it with the edge of the sword. And as for those who had taken refuge in the tower, we set fire to the tower and took both it and them. And as we were departing, the men of Tapia set upon our spoil, and delivering it up to our men, we fought with them as far as Tapia. And we slew them and burnt their city and took as spoil all that was in it. And when I was at the waters of Ozebah, the men of Arbel came against us to battle, and we fought with them and routed them. And their allies from Shiloh slew, and we did not leave them power to come in against us. And the men of Makur came upon us in the fifth day to seize our spoil. We attacked them and overcame them in fierce battle, for there was a host of mighty men among them. And we slew them before they had gone up to the extent. And when we came to their city, the women rolled upon us stones from the bro of the hill on which the city stood. And I and Simeon hid ourselves behind the town, seized upon the heights, and destroyed this city also. And on the next day was told us that the king of the city of Gas the mighty host was coming against us. I, therefore, and Dan feigned ourselves to be Amorites, and as allies went into their city. And in the depth of night, our brethren came, and we opened to them the gates, and we destroyed all the men and their substance, 
took for a prey all that was theirs. And their three walls we cast down, and we drew near to Timnah, where was all the substance of the hostile kings. Then being insulted by them, I was therefore wroth, and rushed against them to the summit. And they kept flinging against me stones and darts. Had not Dan my brother aided me, they would have slain me. We came upon them, therefore, with wrath, and they all fled. And passing by another way, they besought my father, and he made peace with them. And we did to them no hurt, and they became tributaries to us. And we restored to them their spoil, and I built Timnah. And my father built Arbella. I was 18 years old when this war befell. And the Canaanites feared me and my brethren. What's interesting here, Judah and Dan feigned themselves to be Amorites. And also you have in the scriptures when David, when he was in a tough spot with the king, he feigned himself to be a madman. So you can see the children of Judah, they have wisdom in playing a role in order to be delivered from the situation. They're not people that are easy to read, so to speak. Sadly, in this wisdom, when in unrighteousness, you may say, they know how to get over on people by feigning themselves to accommodate the situation. We're crafty. There you go. Because <laughs> Solomon, Solomon even used wisdom on the king of Geshur when he was looking for his sister. Right. He's like, he said, how's my, how's my sister Tamar doing? And he was like, Tamar? I haven't heard of Tamar. What did he do for well? Like something was up with him. So you can find they have craft there. And then also we see here that Judah and Dan in wrath destroyed the people. We went through the Testament and Dan and seeing how wrath is something that his children face. But Judah here, their wrath is different. They have to be brought to the point. Like he said, then being insulted, I was therefore raw. So Judahites, they have to get to that point. He wasn't just angry from the get-go. They get to that point and then they blow up. And you have David, for example. David did well onto Nabal. He kept his sheep for him. He looked out. Yep. And then he sent the messages over. You know, David's all cool. Everything's fine. And then the guy comes back and sends the messengers and they reproach him for doing well. And David got angry. He's like, that's it. So you can see the difference in anger. For Judah, it's more so they can be calm and be cool the whole time. They're not angry until something sets them off and they're gone. That's a difference in anger for Judah. Then you see the difference for a Levite when we get to the lesson. And of course, to overcome anger, be long suffering and understanding, and also be angry and sin not. Go sit upon your bed, sit down and relax, and pray and calm back down to be able to do things in temperance. You also have the admonitions in the Testament of Dan on anger and the Shepherd of Hermas Mandate 5 on angry temper. And you can watch the lesson on Dan. Continuing in the Testament of Judah, he went over what happens in the wars and now he's going on to what came to pass after the war. We're in chapter 8 now. In verse 1. And I have much cattle and I have a chief herdsman. Iram the Adulamite. And when I went to him, I saw Parshaba, king of Adulam, and he spake unto us, and he made us a feast. And when I was heated, he gave me his daughter Bathsheba to wife. He bare me Ir, and Onan, and Shelah, and Shelah. And two of them I had smote. Shelah lived, and his children are ye. And after these things, my son Ir, took to wife Tamar from Mesopotamia, a daughter of Elam. Now Ir was wicked, and he was in need concerning Tamar, because she was not of the land of Canaan. And on the third night, an angel of Ahia smote him, and he had not known her according to the evil craftiness of his mother, but she did not wish to have children by her. Jubilees chapter 41 verse 2 gives more edification on that. Can you read that verse, please? But he hated and did not lie with her, because his mother was of the daughters of Canaan. And he wished to take him a wife of the kinsfolk of his mother. But Judah his father would not permit him. 
talked about how initially how Judah was blessed for his obedience to his father and everything and honoring his mother. And you see the struggles his children faced where Ur was not being obedient to him. We're going to see how it's a struggle with Judah's children and obeying their father. Continuing in the Testament of Judah 9 verse 4. In the days of the wedding feast, I gave Onan to her in marriage. And he also in wickedness knew her not. So he spent with her a year. And when I threatened him, he went in unto her, but he spilled his feet on the ground according to the commandment of his mother. And he also died through wickedness. What Onan did, he played with himself to spill his seed and didn't actually lay with her. When we look at the account of Jubilee, chapter 41, verse 4 and 5, please. In layman's terms, he masturbated. Jubilee, chapter 41, verse 4 through 5. And Judah said unto Onan, his brother, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, and raise up seed unto thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed would not be his, but his brother's only. And he went into the house of his brother's wife, and spilt the seed on the ground. And he was wicked in the eyes of Ahiah, and he slew him. Neither of Judah's son, Ur or Onan, actually lay with Tamar. Hence, her twin sons did not die, so that the seed of Judah may be established. Can you read Jubilee chapter 41, verse 27, please? And unto Judah, we said that his two sons had not lain with her. For this reason, his seed was established for a second generation and would not be rooted out. All right. Continue in Testament of Judah, chapter 9, verse 6, please. And I wished to give Shelah also to her, but his mother did not permit it, for she wrought evil against Tamar, because she was not of the daughters of Canaan, as she also herself was. And I knew that the race of the Canaanites was okay. wicked, but the impulse of youth blinded my mind. Notice, Judah knew what was right, and he wouldn't have done it if he was in his right mind. Yet, and as he explained well, the impulse of youth blinded his mind. One of the impulses of youth, Reuben explained, is the spirit of fornication. And it's seated in the senses, and that spirit worked against him. Continue, please. And when I saw her pouring out wine, owing to the intoxication of wine, I was deceived. And I took her, although my father had not counseled it. See, Judah's sin come when he goes against the counsel of his father. Also, the children of Judah, once drunk, are deceived by the spirit of fornication which causes them to do things they wouldn't do when they're actually sober. All right, so that's a key thing for identifying the Judite. They're fine once they're not drunk. They're one type of way, but once they get to the point of being drunk, they have no control in regards to the spirit of fornication. And to differentiate, we talked about like the children of Joseph, fornication attacks their mind. So they have to be on guard against it within their mind and they have to be mindful of drinking because if they drink, those thoughts that were already in their mind, they're going to be given over to. The difference is for Judah, Judah knows what's right. It's just once he's drunk, there's nothing he can do because he said he knew the race of the Canaanites was wicked, but on to intoxication, he was given over. So you can differentiate the Judite from another tribe. For example, continue, please. And while I was away, she went and took for Sheila, a wife from Canaan. And when I knew what she had done, I cursed her in anguish of my soul. And she also died through her wickedness together with her sons. Continuing in chapter 11, please. And after these things, while Tamar was a widow, Heard after two years that I was going up to share my sheep, adorn herself in bridal array, and sat in the city of Enam by the gate. For it was a law of the Amorites that she who was about to marry should sit in fornication seven days by the gate. Therefore, being drunk with wine, I did not recognize her, and her beauty deceived me through the fashion of her adorning. Judah's struggle with being enamored unto fornication, gazing upon the beauty of women. Whether sober, as in David's case, with Bathsheba, or drunk, as in Judah's case, with Tamar and the Canaanite woman. And I turned aside to her and said, Let me go in unto thee. And she said, What would thou give me? And I gave her my staff and my girdle. 
and the diadem of my kingdom and pledge. And I went in unto her, and she conceived. And not knowing what I had done, I wished to slay her, but she probably sent my pledges and put me to shame. And when I called her, I heard also the secret words which I spoke when lying with her in my drunkenness. And I could not slay her, because it was from Ahia. But I said, at least happily, she did it in subtlety, having received the pledge from another woman. But I came not again near her while I lived, because I have done this abomination in all Israel. Moreover, they who were in the city said there was no harlot in the gate, because she came from another place, and sat for a while in the gate, and I thought that no one knew that I had gone into her. And after this we came into Egypt to Joseph, because of the famine. And I was forty and three years old, and eighty and six years lived I in Egypt. Judah repented from the heart concerning his mistake by evidence of not doing it again, even as David repented for his adultery and didn't do it again. Can you read Jubilees chapter 41, verse 23 to 25, please? And Judah acknowledged that the deed that he had done was evil. But he had lain with his daughter-in-law, and he esteemed it hateful in his eyes, and he acknowledged that he had transgressed and gone astray. But he had uncovered the skirt of his son. He began to lament and to supplicate before Ahiah because of his transgression. And we told him in a dream that it was forgiven him because he supplicated earnestly, lamented, and did not again commit it. He received forgiveness because he turned from his sin and from his ignorance, for he transgressed greatly before Elohim. Also, even in the midst of Judah's falls, we get to see the righteousness of a true Judite. He repented wholeheartedly. He was sincere in his supplication, and he didn't turn back to what he had done wrong, nor did he make any excuses for his mistake. This is something that you find in the children of Judah when they're walking in truth. When they make a mistake, they're very straight. Just like King David, when he got caught up with Bathsheba, he didn't make any excuse. He said, I sinned. Very straightforward. Today, the children of Judah have to be on God firstly to confess their faults. But that's something they struggle with. You have those when they're wrong, they don't want to be told they're wrong, or nor do they want to admit it. For example, Asa, the king. When he was wrong, Ahia sent the prophet to tell him he was wrong, and he didn't even say he was wrong. He just told the prophet, like, are you one of my counselors? Like, you better be quiet before something happened to you. Like, who are you? That's it. <laughs> right. Being arrogant, no one can tell them they're wrong, as we see in the case with Asa, because they don't think folks are worthy of correcting them. So you can see the difference when a Judite's on the wrong track. Like, Judites, they won't be corrected. They're going to do what they want to do. We can have a difference to see how the children of Judah ought to act as opposed to how they're acting today. All right. Let's continue with the Testament of Judah, chapter 12. And now I command you, my children, hearken to Judah your father. Keep my sayings to perform all the ordinances of Ahiah and to obey the commands of Elohim. This is important for you all being obedient to your father. There's a great connection for the children of Judah and being obedient to your father. So keep his sayings that he gives you to perform all the ordinances and obey all the commands. So you have to do it and guard it in everything. All right. Continue, please. And walk not after your lust, nor the imaginations of your thoughts and haughtiness of heart. You have an example of someone being lifted up in the imaginations of the thoughts of their haughtiness of the heart in Uzziah. The king, he was doing well. He was working righteousness, and then he got lifted up and thought he could go offer incense on the altar, which was the duty of the priest. One example to see how one can get lifted up. So humility of mind is key. Well, Solomon is even the example of that. Yes. He got lifted up yes. by his abilities, all the things that I was prospering him in. Yes. All right. Continue, please. And glory not in the deeds and strength of your youth, for this also is evil in the eyes of Ahia. A man ought not to glory in his strength or wisdom, but to glory in that we know Elohim. 
Since I also glorified that in wars no comely woman's face ever enticed me, and reproved Reuben, my brother concerning Bilhah, the wife of my father, the spirits of jealousy and of fornication arrayed themselves against me, until I lay with Bathsheba the Canaanite, and Tamar, who was his spouse to my sons. Judah, not having an issue with the struggle of Reuben, wasn't compassionate to his brother Reuben's shortcomings. Through haughtiness of heart, and glorying in their ability, Judah's children struggle with being uncompassionate to the shortcomings of others because they don't struggle with the same thing, which causes them not to pity their neighbor. And the very spirits that they had no compassion on the person about attack them. They also have to be mindful of jealousy and fornication. Going back into this here, where the spirit of jealousy and fornication arrayed themselves to attack Judah. Now he goes on to explain how they worked against him and what transpired when in the situation with uh, Bashua the Canaanite. Looks like verse 4, please. For I said to my father-in-law, I will take counsel with my father, and so will I take thy daughter. And he was unwilling, but he showed me a boundless store of gold in his daughter's behalf. And he was a king, and he adorned her with gold and pearls, and caused her to pour out wine for us at the feast with the beauty of women. And then fornication with the beauty attacking his eyes. And the wine turned aside my eyes, and pleasure blinded my heart, and I became enamored of, and I lay with her, and transgressed the commandment of Ahiah and the commandment of my fathers. And I took her to wife. And Ahia rewarded me according to the imaginations of my heart, and as much as I had no joy in her children. Let's continue, please. Hopefully this helps give the children of Judah a better understanding of what's going on within them to know and overcome. Chapter 13, verse 1. And now, my children, I say unto you, be not drunk with wine, for wine turneth the mind away from the truth, and inspires the passion of lust, and leadeth the eyes into error. He's telling exactly what happens unto him and to you all Judites. For the spirit of fornication hath wine as a minister to give pleasure to the mind. For these two also take away the mind of man. This is how Judites are overtaken in their mind and do things they wouldn't do sober when they're drunk. They are the types who become different people when drunk. For if a man drank wine to drunkenness, it disturbeth the mind with filthy thoughts, leading to fornication, and heedeth the body to carnal union. And if the occasion of the lust be present, he worketh the sin, and is not ashamed. Such is the inebriated man, my children. He who is drunken reverence no man. For lo, it made me also to error. So that I was not ashamed of the multitude in the city, and that before the eyes of all I turned aside unto Tamar, and I wrought a great sin, and I uncovered the covering of my son's shame. After I had drunk wine, I reverenced not the commandment of Elohim, and I took a woman of Canaan to wife. For much discretion needeth the man who drinketh wine, my children, and herein is discretion in drinking wine. A man may drink. So long as he preserve his modesty. But if he go beyond this limit, the spirit of deceit attacketh his mind, and it maketh the drunkard to talk filthily, and to transgress and not be ashamed, but even to glory in his shame, and to account himself honorable. Judah understood that his sons would struggle with fornication through their lusts and imaginations of their hearts, being enamored with the beauty of women, and or being drunk with wine. He teaches his sons how fornication is to a man's downfall by his own experience so that they will understand the works of fornication and stay away from it. Understanding the works of fornication is key for Judites, seeing what's working against you, because subconsciously fornication works against Judites. And this is the major spirit that works against the tribe of Judah. Um, All of the other spirits may come but they are not as strong as fornication on the tribe of Judah, whether it be for men or women. The important thing to understand 
is that subconsciously these spirits are working against you. Always being mindful of that. Everything has to be on the surface level. You can't let anything gain deeper ground or anything, you know, go into the soil, so to speak. You have to keep everything on the surface. Like if you see somebody that's attractive, that person is very attractive in this surface and you leave it right there. You don't feed into it or you don't uh, indulge yourself in the thought. One thing that truly helps is because a lot of times, even with Judah and the examples we have in the patriarch and the examples we have in the scriptures, it was always usually a woman of a strange nation that caused the Judite to fall. And this is why the admonition that Joseph gave in the book of Joseph and Asenath was very key because Joseph, his mindset was... Joseph and Asenath, chapter 7, verse 6. Keep yourselves, children, securely from a strange woman so as not to have fellowship with her. For fellowship with her is ruin and destruction. Keeping that mindset that, hey, this is a strange woman or this is a strange man keeps you away from falling into that destruction. And we always have to be in that mindset, always being on guard, making sure that we're not indulging ourselves in thoughts that are causing us to be cast astray with how a strange woman or how a strange man may dress or how they may operate. We have to always keep that mindset of Allahayim, Allahayim. What is right in the sight of Allahayim? I'm not going to fall to a strange woman or a strange man, no matter what's going on, no matter what they have, no matter what comes with them, even in the case with the gold, with Judah. We have to keep our minds set on Elohim. That's a strange person. That person's not worshiping Elohim. That person's not following Elohim. And we have to walk in that. And that keeps us away from turning to the left or the right. And of course, drinking in moderation. That is key. This is one of the things I even had to learn myself was drinking in moderation and not getting to the point of drunkenness because once you get to the point of drunkenness for a Judite, you can pretty much call it a day. Um, we really have to be mindful. As much as we like to drink, we really have to be mindful where we're drinking, how much we're drinking, what is our surroundings. We have to be in tune with everything going on around us. So these are the ammunitions to help overcome. We have to truly have our surroundings in order. Let's look at chapter 14, please. He that committed fornication is not aware when he suffers loss. And it's not ashamed when put to dishonor. But even though a man be a king and commit fornication, he is stripped of his kingship by becoming the slave of fornication, as I myself also suffered. When fornication does overcome Judah, they are enslaved to it by example of not only Judah, but David also in the matter of Bathsheba. And then Solomon became a slave to fornication through getting enamored with the beauty of the Shunammite, to do whatever she said just to get her in bed. So when Judites are enslaved through wine or the gazing upon beauty, They'll do what they have to do to get the woman they want, like David, who committed fornication to get her, Solomon sacrificed the idols, and Judah gave up his staff, diadem, and acted without the counsel of his father. It can be the wine, as in Judah's case, or the beauty of women, as in David and Solomon's case, for Judah's children to be overtaken by fornication, or the lusts and haughty imaginations of one's heart, like in Absalom's case, who desired the kingship that would lead a Judite to be a slave to fornication. Reuben was shown by the angel, women are overcome with fornication more than men. So the daughters of Judah have a real struggle with fornication when drunk and or enamored with another's beauty. Or for the love of money, they are overcome as well. All right. As far as Judah, when fornication overtakes you, you're pretty much captive. Like there's nothing you can do. You can't turn to the left hand or to the right hand. You're fixated and you're going to complete what it is you're fixated on. 
That's what they're talking about. When it says he's a slave to fornication, like you're literally under the dominion of fornication. Like you're not going to be able to turn or break away from it. Case in point, Amnon was enamored with his sister and sick in love with her, but as soon as he fulfilled his desire, he didn't care for her once the spirit of fornication got what it wanted. You'll find Judites can be in love until the lust for the person's beauty wears off in some cases. Hopefully that all helps Judites identify themselves and know what's happening to them through the lust of the eye or wine to know how the spirit works against you so that you don't get in a predicament to be enslaved. That's why he said, as long as you do it in modesty. Because as far as Judah, we have to do everything in moderation. That's how we protect ourselves from the spirits that try to attack us. Uh, we can't drink too much. can't really do anything too much. We have to be level at all times. Thank you for the exhortation. You have the lesson, the lust of the eyes, and Reuben lesson for admonitions on fornication. Also, you have the testament of Joseph for the children of Judah to see the different ways a person can seek to entice you onto fornication and to see how a woman can seek to entice a man onto fornication. Continue when you ready. Thank you. For I gave my staff, that is the stay of my tribe, and my girdle, that is my power, and my diadem, that is the glory of my kingdom. And indeed, I repented of these things. Wine and flesh I eat not until my old age, nor did I behold any joy. And the angel of Elohim showed me that forever do women bear rule over king and beggar alike. And from the king they take away his glory. Solomon. And from the valiant man his might. Samson. And from the beggar even that little which is the stay of his poverty. That happens still to this day. Your father showed how when fornication rules you, women have power over you, regardless of your status in life, even as befell Judah. Many Judites get played by beautiful women, being enamored to give her whatever they have. Also, Judite women are known for being crafty and using their beauty to deceive the mind and take rule over men. So you will find daughters of Judah struggling with a serpent authority over a man in the heartiness of their imaginations, following thoughts according to their lusts. Notice, the first step to overcoming these things is repentance. Seeing things for what they are, speaking truth in your heart, then, as Zachwa mentioned, you have to be moderate in all things. Even as Judah toned it down from wine and flesh in repentance to get to a place wherein he is walking in moderation. We are at chapter 15 now, Brother Zachwa. Observe, therefore, my children, the right limit in wine, for there are in it four evil spirits of lust, of hot desire, of profligacy, of filthy mm -hmm. lucre. Interestingly, wine is referred to as spirits in America, and here we see there truly are spirits working in it. The definition of lust is very strong sexual desire. The definition of hot desire strong sexual attraction or desire profligacy means reckless extravagance or wastefulness in the use of resources so you can see how children of judah when rappers or pro athletes for example blow money in extravagance and wastefulness the way society attacks a black man is pretty much geared against the children of judah showing them gold offering them wealth and then the beauty of women to enamor them to be overtaken and do whatever they are asked to get them. These people behind the scenes understand who we are and what is needed to cause us to fall, as was said in Jubilees chapter 23 verse 23, that they shall use transgression against Jacob. So they particularly know the things needed to get Judah, Benjamin, and Levi to fall. Profligacy also means licentious or dissolute behavior. Lust also means promiscuous and unprincipled in sexual matters. And dissolute means lax in morals. So wine causes Judites to get enslaved by fornication to commit immoral sexual acts. You also have the definition of filthy lucre. 
which means money, especially when gained in a dishonest or dishonorable way. So you'll find the children of Judah struggle with attaining money in dishonorable ways. Let's continue, please. If ye drink wine in gladness, be ye modest. It's in the fear of Elohim. There you see, there's nothing wrong with drinking in itself. Just stay in modesty in the fear of Elohim. Modesty means behavior, manner, or appearance intended to avoid impropriety or indecency. So it's important to keep modesty for the following reasons. For if in your gladness the fear of Elohim departeth, then drunkenness arises and shamelessness still is in. That's what you want to avoid because Judites struggle with being shameless once they get drunk and they'll just be trying to lay with someone they are enamored with as Judah wasn't ashamed to go after Tamar before all the people of the city once he saw her beauty. All right, continue please. But if you would live soberly, do not touch wine at all. Least ye sin in words of outrage and in fightings and slanders and transgressions of the commandments of Elohim, and ye perish before your time. Judites can talk filthily slander or speak angry words and get into arguments and fights when drunk also they won't have any reverence for the commandments when drunk so you can understand being overtaken with fornication also causes spiritual fornication it's more than just fornication that overtakes but when he gets drunk every evil spirit attacks him when he gets drunk so he completely turns into a different person all right, so you can identify a Judite. They're completely changed once they've gone to that drunken state. Moreover, wine <laughs> revealeth the mysteries of Elohim and men. Even as I also revealed the commandments of Elohim and the mystery of Jacob my father to the Canaanite woman Bathsheba, which Elohim bade me not to reveal. And wine is a cause both of war and confusion. You when they drunk, more than likely a fight or ensue. Or they're going to be Issues. saying things that they ain't supposed to be saying. Right. Chapter 16. And now I command you, my children, not to love money, nor to gaze upon the beauty of women. He's telling you very straightly the things to avoid. He went over what fornication does. He's telling you how wine works and the spirits that work against you in both cases. Now he's giving you more admonition to help keep you here. To know not to love money, nor to gaze upon the beauty of woman. Don't get caught up in a woman's beauty. Because it's going to cause you to fall. Nor love money to let it sway or entice you in decision making as it did Judah. Continue, please. Because for the sake of money and beauty, I was led astray to Bethshua the Canaanite. For I know that because of these two things, Shall my race fall into wickedness? These two things are the chief issues that cause Judites to fall into wickedness, doing wicked acts for love of money or to get a beautiful woman. Continue, please. But even wise men among my sons shall they mar. That was Solomon. It shall cause the kingdom of Judah to be diminished, which Ahiah gave me because of my obedience to my father. Love of money and gazing upon the beauty of women diminish the kingdom of Judah to not hearken to their fathers to work righteousness. Judah goes on to explain how good he was to his father to give you an example of how you ought to become. For I never caused grief to Jacob my father. For all things whatsoever he commanded I did. And Isaac the father of my father blessed me to be king in Israel. And Jacob further blessed me in like manner. And I know that from me shall the kingdom be established. Your father reminds you it was his obedience to his father that got him the blessings of the kingship so that you would hearken and be obedient to him and receive a blessing. Continue, please. And I know what evils ye shall do in the last days. Beware, therefore, my children of fornication and the love of money and hearken to Judah your father. These are the chief things Judah struggle with in these last days. The love of money, fornication, and hearkening to the voice of Judah, the patriarch. There is a spiritual connection with Judah and hearkening to their father in order to receive blessings. Manasseh, for example, did not hearken to his father Hezekiah and was given over to Belier and died. 
as we seen the same case with Ur and Onan. Continue reading, please. But these things withdraw you from the law of Elohim. So for money's sake and fornication, Judites would break the law. And blind the inclination of the soul. Love of money and fornication blind Judite's soul from seeing things in truth. And teach arrogance. These spirits lead them to struggle with arrogance. And suffer not a man to have compassion upon his neighbor. Judite struggle with being arrogant and not having compassion on others as was the case with Reuben. They robbed his soul of all goodness. Manasseh, king of Judah, exemplifies this. And oppress him with toils and troubles, and drive away sleep from him, and devour his flesh. The spiritual attack from the love of money and fornication in the mind of a Judite can lead to alcoholism or drug usage to ease the mind from the depression or anxiety they struggle with. Now we have understanding that a lot of Judites struggle with alcoholism or substance abuse. Continue, please. And he hindereth the sacrifices of Elohim. These spirits hinder from a contrite heart and a broken spirit, according to Psalms 55, which are the true sacrifices. And he remembereth not the blessings of Elohim. Even as Judah forgot the blessings through obedience when he was thinking about the beauty of the woman and the money that was there. He hearkeneth not to a prophet when he speaketh, and resenteth the words of holiness. This befell Asa, the king of Judah, who despised the words of the prophet. So a Judite can respond arrogantly for correcting them, and they have a struggle resenting words of holiness. Continue, please. For he is a slave to two contrary passions, and cannot obey Elohim, because they have blinded his soul, and he walketh in the day as in the night. Judah is showing that the love of money and the spirit of fornication are chief things that blind Judah to walk in darkness, which is everything contrary to the light of the law. Continuing, please. Um, I have a, if you have something, please. I have an identifier. When a Judite is in iniquity, and I'm sure many of us have came across a Judite while trying to preach the gospel or talk about somebody about the gospel, it's key identifier to know who you're dealing with. When they're in iniquity, in verse 6 of chapter 17, it says, For he is a slave to two contrary passions, and cannot obey Elohim, because they are blind to his soul, and walketh in the day as in the night. If you ever came across a person and you're trying to tell them something, and they can understand what you're saying, but they just can't grasp it, like they're not arguing with you, they're not giving you a hard time, but they can't grasp it, that's because their soul has been blinded. What you're saying may make a lot of sense, but they can't grasp it. So it's interesting. Chapter 18, please. My children, the love of money leadeth to idolatry, because when led astray through money, then name as Elohim's those who are not Elohim's. And it causeth him who hath it to fall into madness. The love of money leads to spiritual fornication and idolatry, which is covetousness. Colossians 3 and 5 Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Hopefully this helps understand idolatry that Judites fall into includes covetousness. Continue please. For the sake of money, I lost my children. Had not my repentance and my humiliation and the prayers of my father been accepted, I should have died childless. So the keys for deliverance for Judah is repentance, humility, and prayer. Asking your everlasting father, Yahweh, to pray for you since he is our mediator. As John the Judite understood this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, please. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahweh Christ, the righteous. Those who have fathers ought to ask their father to pray for them as well, since we see that Judah's father's prayers delivered him. Continue, please, Zachar. I'm back in the Testament of Judah, chapter 18. For the sake of money, I lost my children. Had not my repentance and my humiliation and the prayers of my father been accepted, I should have died childless. But the Elohim of my father yeah. had mercy on me, because I did it in ignorance. 
And the prince of deceit blinded me, and I sinned as a man, and as flesh, being corrupted through sins. And I learned my own weakness while thinking myself invincible. The children of Judah get blinded by the prince of deceit to think that they are Alahayims in heartiness of their imaginations of their hearts, to think they are invincible as befell Judah. Hence, meekness and lowliness of heart is a strong defense for the children of Judah. Yache was the example for you all being of your tribe. Matthew 11, verse 29 and 30, please. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The humility delivers and it lightens the burden of the spirits of fornication and the love of money that attack. In the Testament of Judah, chapter 17, verse 4, Judah had said they rob his soul of all goodness and oppress him with toils and troubles and drive away sleep from him and devour his flesh. On the other hand, you have seen through Yache how being meek and lowly of heart gives you rest unto your souls. Yache, the son of Judah, according to the flesh, faced the same temptation as you, his brethren, being tempted with money by the devil, spiritual fornication to serve the devil, and also to exalt himself as Allah Hayim in the world. Yache, being an example for you all, did not give over to either of it. Let's read our Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 7. Can you read that, please? But nothing okay. be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It's profitable for Judites not to think they are better than others, lest hardiness get an advantage over them. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Judah, as a king, is servant to his kingdom. Hence the spirit of charity is very profitable for Judites because she does not look after her own but unto the things of others continue please but this mind be in you which was also in christ yache who being in the form of alahayim thought it not robbery to be equal with alahayim but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Judah's blessings lie in obedience to his father. Hence, Yache received his blessings once his obedience was fulfilled, even as Judah in his obedience to his father in all things. As the children of Judah, you are meant to be a testimony in the world of Yache himself. Now you hopefully have an understanding of how you do that, being obedient in all things, in humility. Continue, please. Wherefore, Elohim also have highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. Praise Ahia. Your father Judah goes on to give you wisdom to understand the spiritual warfare so that you may prevail through repentance, humility, prayer, and obedience as he did. We are back in Testament of Judah, chapter 19, please. So, therefore, my children, that two spirits wait upon man, the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. And in the midst is the spirit of understanding of the mind, to which it belongeth to turn whithersoever it will. And the works of truth and the works of deceit are written upon the hearts of men, and each one of them a knoweth. And there is no time at which the works of men can be hid, for on the heart itself have they been written down before Ahiah. And the spirit of truth testifieth all things, and accuseth all. And the sinner is burnt up by his own heart, and cannot raise his face to the judge. And John the Judite knew of the wisdom given unto Judah, and edified us further on the matter as well. First um, John chapter three, verse nineteen to twenty-one, please. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, Allah is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, 
then we have confidence toward Elohim. Judah knew what would befall his sons in the last days, and knew they would need Levi, though Levi would be struggling in the last days as well. Hence he left them commands concerning them, so that they would not lack compassion towards them, nor would they glorify themselves above them, as is common due to the spirits that attack Judah. Testament Judah chapter 20, now. And now, my children, I command you, love Levi, that ye may abide, to exalt not yourselves against him, lest ye be utterly destroyed. For to me a higher gave the kingdom, and to him the priesthood. And he set the kingdom beneath the priesthood. To me he gave the things upon the earth, to him the things in heavens. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so is the priesthood of Elohim higher than the earthly kingdom. Unless it falls away through sin from Ahiah and is dominated by the earthly kingdom. For the angel of Ahiah said unto me, Ahiah chose him rather than thee to draw near to him and to eat of his table to offer him the first fruits of the choice things of the sons of Israel. But thou shalt be king of Jacob. He gave his sons understanding from on high, so that they would not give place to any haughty imagination against their brother Levi. Continue, please, in chapter 20, verse 6 now. And thou shalt be amongst them as the sea. For as on the sea, just and unjust are tossed about. Some taken into captivity, while some are enriched. So also shall every race of men be in thee. Some shall be impoverished being taken captive, and others grow rich by plundering the possessions of others. For the kings shall be as sea monsters. They shall swallow men like fishes. The sons and daughters of free men shall they enslave. Houses, lands, flocks, money shall they plunder. Then the patriarch read in Enoch of how Judah will be plunderers through covetousness. You can find them doing this during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD as well. When you read the account of Josephus, you hear how people were plundering everyone. Those are the Judites. Predominantly. According to the testimonies here. You see what Dan said in Testament of Dan, chapter 5, verse 6, please. By I read in the book Sorry. of Enoch, the righteous, the sons of Judah will be covetous, plundering other men's goods like lions. Today, a robber has a good probability of being a Judite. Levites are robbers too, but Judites are plunderers as well. Plunder means to steal goods from a place or person, typically using force and in a time of war or civil disorder. Sadly, that points out what tribe a lot of Israelites are who go robbing stores and such in times of social unrest. Plunder also means the violent and dishonest acquisition of property. So a Judite can be a robber straight up, or they can do it by dishonest business practices, as is among wherever they dwell. You can find it easily in West Africa among the Nigerians, and here in America among the Negroes. Testament of Judah, chapter 20, verse 8, please. And with the flesh of many shall they wrongfully feed the ravens and the cranes. And they shall advance in evil. This tribe is already crafty, as we spake of before. And here in these times they are wise to do evil. And covetousness uplifted. So it's their covetousness that causes them to be lifted up in heartiness of heart. Right. And there shall be false prophets like Tempest. It only right. makes sense that a lot of Judites will be false prophets because of the things that gain their attention. The women, the love of money. And drunkenness, like they're, they're in it for gain. That's why he talked about the filthy Luca. Right. Now, one of the spirits that attack through wine. False prophets are found among Judah. You shall know them by their fruits. If the fruits of the Spirit are there or growing forth, then they are inwardly ravening wolves in sheep's clothing, plundering others, taking their money. Sadly, Judites are among the religious figures in various religions among the Negroes plundering people's money and such in craft using the prosperity gospel or other means of false prophesying and dishonesty with the people. 
Judah shall be among the wicked elders of the children of Israel here in these end times, too, going after filthy lucre, overcome by the love of money. Ascension of Isaiah, chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. And there shall be many wicked elders and shepherds who wrong their sheep, and they will be rapacious because they do not have holy shepherds. Rapacious means excessively grasping or covetous verse 25 and many will exchange the glory of the robes of the saints for the robes of those who love money and there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of the glory of this world hopefully that helps for understanding what's coming and what the children of judah will be struggling with in these end times continuing in the testament of judah chapter 20 verse 9 please and they shall persecute all righteous men. That confirms the children of Judah will be among the Israelites in their respective religions persecuting the two witnesses, trying to make the gospel of none effect by their false prophesyings as the ascension of Isaiah chapter 3 spake of. Since they'll be haughty in their imaginations, they'll speak whatever burst out of their own hearts. It'll be about money. You can differentiate. It'll be, right. It'll be like a Creflo dollar. Right, so... You see the difference is to differentiate which tribe the people are from. All right, continue, please. And the highest shall bring upon them divisions, one against another. Now, interesting, as you touched on them doing it for the attention as well, Judah's children covet the glory of being rulers, every man doing according to their own hearty imaginations. Hence, they have social circles, but they do their own thing for the most part. And there are divisions amongst the Judites because they don't walk in lowliness of mind with one another. Understanding this and reading the Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 helps understand that some of the leaders in the many divisions of the religious groups among Israel are Judites, whether modern Christian or among the Israelite groups today. And their love of money and the filthy lucre are telltale signs. All right, continue, please. And there shall be continual wars in Israel. And among men of another race shall my kingdom be brought to an end. Continue, please. Until the salvation of Israel shall come, until the appearance of the Elohim of righteousness, that Jacob and all the Gentiles may rest in peace. The kingdom of Judah will be reestablished when Christ comes to save all nations in the end. And he shall guard the might of my kingdom forever. For I highest swear to me with an oath that he would not destroy the kingdom from my seed forever. All right. Continue, please, in, in chapter 22. Now I have found much grief, my children, because of your lewdness and witchcraft and idolatry, which ye shall practice against the kingdom, following them that have familiar spirits, diviners, and demons of error. That's one thing that a lot of the women fall into. They fall into diviners. Then they have familiar spirits. A lot of them fall into that type of stuff. The tarot card readings, the astrology, and all that stuff. They go into a lot of that. Also, the definition of lewdness is G4467. It means easy, that is reckless. An easygoing behavior, that is by extension, a crime lewdness so judites fall into crime but they also can be easygoing and passive not assuming any responsibility accountability or taking on a leadership role in their family letting their women rule over them they may even be the types that just do whatever others may suggest though they know better this is a part of the struggles they face continue please you shall make your daughters Singing girls and harlots. Judite women fall into being entertainers, dancers, prostitutes, and strippers. Anything that garners attention or for the love of money. And ye shall okay. mingle in the abominations of the Gentiles. For which thing's sake, Ahia, shall bring upon you famine and pestilence, death and the sword. Beleaguering by enemies and, and revelings of friends, the slaughter of children. The rape of wives, the plundering of possessions, 
the burning of the temple of Elohim, and the laying waste of the land, the enslavement of yourselves among the Gentiles. This is how you know Judah's ancestry come from the slaves around the world. And they shall make some of you eunuchs for their wives. Judites in slavery were being castrated to tend to master's wives. And these things are going to be happening to the children of Judah all the way, as verse 5 says, if you read, please. Until Ahia visit you, when with perfect heart you repent and walk in all his commandments, and he bring you up from captivity among the Gentiles. So because of our iniquity and following after the Elohims of the nations, we're under their Elohims. Because once we fall and start following their Elohims, they have dominion over us. That's why we got it the worst. Judah got it the worst in slavery. Repentance with a perfect heart and walking in all his commandments is what will arouse the Lion of Judah to visit you. That word perfect, H8003, means complete, friendly, just, quiet, peaceable, and whole. To help understand the heart that a person of Judah must have. The deliverance for Judah's children will come when they repent with their whole heart and sincerity, humble themselves, walking in meekness and lowliness of heart, and pray for deliverance and walk in all the commandments. Uh, continue, please. Chapter 23 of the Testament of Judah. And after these things shall the star arise to you from Jacob in peace, and a man shall arise from my seed, like the son of righteousness. Walking with the sons of men in meekness and righteousness, and no sin shall be found in him. And the heavens shall be opened unto him, to pour out the Spirit, even the blessing of the Holy Father. And he shall pour out the Spirit of grace upon you, and ye shall be unto him sons in truth. And ye shall walk in his commandments <laughs> first and last. This branch of Allah Most High, and this fountain given life unto all, then shall the scepter of my kingdom shine forth, and from your root shall arise a stem, and from it shall grow a rod of righteousness to the Gentiles, to judge, and to save all that call upon Ahia. And after these things shall Abraham and Isaac and Jacob arise unto life, and I and my brethren shall be chiefs of the tribes of Israel. Now we're in Yahweh's kingdom. Chapter 23, he went over... Ayachi was going to bring all things together in the end. And now we're in the first resurrection. Judah saw who would get their blessings in order. Levi first, I the second, Joseph third, Benjamin fourth, Simeon fifth, Issachar sixth. So all in order. And Ahia blessed Levi, and the angel of the presence, me, and the powers of glory, Simeon. And the heaven Reuben, the earth Issachar, the sea Zebulun, the mountains Joseph, the tabernacle Benjamin, the luminaries Dan, Eden Naphtali, the sun Gad, the moon Asher. And ye shall be the people of Ahia, and have one tongue. There shall be there no spirit of deceit of Belier, for he shall be cast into the fire forever. And they who died in grief shall arise in joy. And they who were poor for a higher sake shall be made rich. And they who are put to death for a higher sake shall awake to life. And the hearts of Jacob shall run in joyfulness. And the eagles of Israel shall fly in gladness. And all the people shall glorify higher forever. Amen. Of the 24. Observe therefore, my children, all the law of Ahia, for there is hope for all them who hold fast unto his ways. His last command was to observe all the law of Ahia, so that they may have hope by holding fast unto the wisdom of his ways. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18 to 20, please. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in the book out of which is before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life, 
that he may learn the fear of Ahiah, his Elohim, to keep all the words of this law, his statutes, to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, in the midst of Israel. All right, in closing, finishing up verse 2 unto the end, please. And he said to them, Behold, I die before your eyes this day, a hundred and twenty-nine years old, that no one bury me falsely apparel, nor tear open my bowels, for this shall they who are kings do. And carry me up to Hebron with you. And Judah, when he had said these things, fell asleep. And his sons did according to all whatsoever he commanded them. And they buried him in Hebron with his fathers. Even unto his death, he stayed in meekness, didn't want to be exalted for a testimony for his children. And that's the testament of Judah. Hope it was edifying, brothers and sisters. And that's it on the tribe of Judah. So hopefully everybody can identify with the tribe of Judah, at least understand the tribe of Judah. I hope that this lesson is edifying and it helps those of the tribe of Judah to overcome the the battle and the temptations that are laid against us so that we can grow to the perfection of the saints in Meshiach Ayache. Keep your eyes vigilant for the adversary of the devil comes seeking at the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and just be always vigilant of your surroundings always vigilant of yourself and what's going on with within you and being honest with yourself so that you can overcome it, confess your faults and repent unto Allah and keep your eye on the prize, not veering off to the left hand or to the right hand. I'll keep you all. We love you. Peace.